When I was a kid growing up in uh, Montreal on the, <clears throat> on the west side of the island, we lived in a forest of uh, maple trees. This isn't it. It's the only thing I can come across that might accurately represent it. But uh, in that forest of maple trees, we built a fort like kids do. And it was in that fort that I was first introduced to a concept um, called camera obscura. The fort had a number of holes in it, one of which happened to be the right uh, size in terms of its uh, diameter, and also happened to be the right distance away from the back wall of the fort where it would pull an image upside down, backwards, of what was uh, in front of that fort. And um, through the physics of light, uh, we were able to see through our little spy hole on our fort, the enemy, the kids from Butternut Street coming to attack us that way. Well, um, that introduced me to this whole concept of the uh, camera obscura. And uh, since that's something that we're going to be working with uh, about every day, your camera itself, I thought I'd get into an explanation of that <clears throat> and into the actual devices uh, themselves that we might be using and uh, some history behind that. This um, image that you're seeing here is a, a part of a project by uh, Abelardo Morel, who uh, has published a book on his camera obscura, he actually creates these by figuring out the diameter of the hole that light needs to go to, through in order to hit a wall of a, of a room uh, that happens to be facing. So what you're seeing here actually is a, is a camera obscura of uh, Central Park in New York City, and he happens to be in an apartment that he was able to darken completely and then cut a hole in the, the plastic, the dark plastic that he used to cover the windows with this, and then uh, right at the right um, diameter, and then uh, to be able to focus what you're seeing on the wall here. Eventually, he end, ended up using uh, actual ground glass uh, in the holes in order to full focus and make a, a real sharp image, and then he, and then he uses a camera to take a picture inside the camera <laughs> of what's going on here. Pretty cool, right? Aristotle stumbled upon this um, in terms of noticing how light and the physics of light go through and, and uh, given the diameter of the hole and the proximity of the film plane or that back wall to that hole would actually go through and uh, create an image. Okay, So that goes back to ancient Greece that way. Um, he noticed this during a partial eclipse of the sun, so um, there was also some, some other light dynamics going on within that. Let me show you one more of uh, Morel's work here. Pretty fascinating, right? Well, that introduces this notion of the camera obscura, which translated means camera means um, chamber, and obscura means dark. So we're talking about a dark room. And that's basically what your actually what your camera is, not the lens or the viewpiece or anything else that way, but it's a place where light can be recorded. And the only place that we can record light is in that dark chamber or inside a camera. Chances are when you think of camera, something like this might come to mind. Well, probably not. For me, this is what comes to mind because this is what I used as a professional. I used a, a couple of Nikon F3s. And these were single lens reflex cameras that shot on 35 millimeter film. And in, in photojournalism, um, this really was the, uh, the, the easiest size and the, and the largest um, film plane that you could use to go through and capture a story without lugging around something bigger. This gave you the quality that would uh, work okay in newsprint uh, or on television, uh, in magazines, that kind of thing. And uh, the old Nikon kind of three really was a workhorse with that. And one of the main reasons why was uh, because of its a uh, lot of interchangeability on the camera, um, but a lot also had to do with the shutter uh, on the camera. Here, the shutter is built into the camera. There are some cameras where the shutter is actually built into the lens. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, this had a metal shutter, and it could shoot up to one four thousandth of a second. Here is a titanium shutter. This is in an FE two, I believe, in an icon. And the whole idea of a single lens reflex, a lot of people don't understand what that means. So let me show you a cutaway here of the F3. This is an old F3, where you have uh, the lens, you have the ground glass, light comes in through that lens and it, and it hits off that mirror and the mirror bounces it up into the viewfinder and the viewfinder bounces it out to the eye, right? <clears throat> when you're ready to release the shutter, then the mirror itself folds up and then light is recorded on the film plane. So you are able to see 
what it is that you're going to get. What you see is what you get. It's a WYSIWYG interface. Uh, and there were some troubles with this because in the time it took sometimes for the mirror to go up and then for the shutter release, um, you might have missed whatever action it was that you were trying to uh, get. But this was a standard, really, for um, what journalists were working with um, before the digital era. And what was also nice about DSLRs was uh, their ability to accept a number of different lenses. Uh, all the major camera companies, uh, Nikon, Canon, Olympus, uh, made a, a full complement of ground glass, or they had another company do that. Nikkor was the, the company that did it for Nikon. And uh, you can go through and, and uh, supercharge your cameras. This uh, F3 has a motor drive on it that would give you four frames a second, depending on your shutter speed with that. So these became really the instruments uh, in, that set the precedence for what we're studying in, in photojournalism now, in digital photojournalism. Um, before this apparatus, the journalists were working with uh, what's most called a twin lens reflex. This is a Rolly twin lens reflex. Um, this uh, had the, the twin lens, meaning one lens would go to the focal plane, or the film plane, excuse me, and the other lens would go to your eye. And it goes to your, uh, to your eye bouncing off of a mirror and then through a viewfinder so you could see what was going on. The advantage of this camera was it was relatively still small for um, the purposes of working in field to journalism that way. Uh, and yet it shot on 128 millimeter film, uh, giving it a, a more emulsion to work with in terms of clarity of the picture. The, the downside was um, lenses weren't immediately interchangeable for the rule of flex. And uh, you didn't have a wide angle or a telephoto, you just were kind of stuck with the standard lens. Um, they later got into uh, actually making different types of prime lenses for this, um, but a little too late because the 35 millimeter market kind of took over. Beyond uh, this in the medium format was the Hasselblad. This is a Hasselblad 500C. And it was also a, a workhorse camera. This shot on two and a quarter by two and a quarter inch film, uh, 120 uh, millimeter film with a two and a quarter by two and a quarter square negative that it would create. You see the three main aspects of this camera. If you looked at it from front to back, the front being the lens, and it had a whole complement of interchangeable lenses. The middle part being the camera obscura. There's a mirror in there, and there's also a primary um, shutter within that, depending on the camera. And then behind that is the actual film magazine. You would load that uh, rear piece, and you could snap them off and on uh, to go through, because you only had 12 exposures on a back, on a roll that way. You would have several backs set and ready to go. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine just shooting 12 exposures per roll as opposed to the 150 exposures you did for your axioms assignment? You, you needed to know what you were doing back then. Hasselblad, uh, what made this camera stand out above any other camera ever made is, uh, well, two things. One was the fact that the shutter is actually built into the lens. It had a leaf shutter built into the lens. A secondary shutter uh, in the back of the camera that coordinated with its release um, in order to go through and expose onto the film plane. And that this thing was made from Swiss uh, components. The, the, the camera was indestructible. It was not electronic. It was totally uh, worked on uh, spring principles. Uh, and then they were very expensive back in the day. Well, they're very expensive back in, in, in this day as well, that way. But they provided uh, clarity with uh, Carl Zeiss lenses beyond any other camera that was out there. They were simple. Uh, they were easy to repair. They worked in all kinds of temperatures. Uh, they were just a fantastic camera. I love my Hasselblad. Then from 35 to medium, medium to large format, uh, this is a large format camera. This is a Horseman, uh, looks like maybe a 5x7 camera. And uh, as photography became more um, developed, if you pardon the pun, um, this was the camera that started it in terms of having two planes, one plane where your lens rested, and the secondary plane, like the back of this camera here, is where the light would, would come into focus and register, or what we call the film plane with that. So um, this hung around because you really couldn't, uh, nothing really, really compared to a negative that was five inches by seven inches, or eight by 10, or, or 16 by, uh, by 20, uh, a huge, uh, large format. 
cameras that way. Uh, and this is the simplest form. The, the lens itself had the shutter built into it, much like the Hasselblad format. Um, and if you were to go through and frame this up, you were stuck uh, doing it without any kind of uh, correction in terms of parallax or orientation. So you saw it upside down and backwards, and that's how you'd go through and compose your frame. Um, I've shot a five by seven for a number of years. Uh, long story behind that, maybe we'll go into that someday. Loved it though, it's a great way to go through and explore your craft as a, as a photographer. But that brings us down to what we're facing now, and that's the digital single lens reflex camera. And there are, so there's the DSLR, okay, and then there's also the mirrorless digital camera, and I'll get into a, an explanation there. The, the, the DSLR has the mirror that still goes up and reveals as the shutter exposes the film plane beneath it, and the mirror can go back down again. Uh, and it's a great option. You see through it, uh, you, you see right through the lens in a DSLR, whereas on a mirrorless camera you don't. You see on a display what uh, the camera, what the camera's sensor is picking up that way. What's been interesting about the DSLR revolution is its foray into motion picture production. You know, we're dealing with uh, pickup devices that uh, now in the, into the 4K realm are producing um, images just as uh, brilliant and clear and uh, with a color palette that rivals any kind of film out there that um, uh, many of the cameras that we have out there now, even the um, Rebel uh, T, whatever series is out now, um, has the ability to shoot in uh, 1080i. My little Fujinon X-M1 shoots in 1080i, full, full frame, not full frame, um, full shutter video, full pixel, full Anyway, you get the idea. And frame becomes an issue here, okay? And that becomes confusing to a lot of people. Because since we set a standard in terms of frame size uh, in 35 millimeter, um, when we started creating other sensors to replace the concept of emulsion, um, those frame sizes started to get smaller and smaller. And that became problematic when we were using old lenses with new cameras. It became problematic with the idea that, uh, well, what, is a, what does a 50 millimeter lens see anymore? As opposed, if it's on a 35 millimeter camera, as opposed to being set up on a camera that's only uh, 24 millimeter or 17 millimeter or so on. And what does it do that way? I've got a couple of resources for you to check out and I'll link out to those uh, within this module so you can see. But to kind of um, illustrate that. This, for example, is uh, the difference between a full frame sensor, which is what you're going to spend a lot of money on, and then an APS-C uh, sensor or even a, a smaller sensors where um, you're not going to get the full frame that the lens that was made was intended to go through and give you. So there's uh, some correction for that that we're seeing within our uh, digital lenses, that our digital cameras that way. Um, if you really want to explore this in depth, there's a great little um, interactive uh, field of view comparison page up. It's on abelcine.com, A-B-E-L-C-I-N-E.com, all one word. I'll put a, there's a link out to this in the module as well, where you can go through and plug in uh, the uh, source that you're using, the, kind, the lens, and then it can go through and give you a comparison in terms of what you'll be seeing or what's cropped out that way. Honestly, uh, I haven't really given it a whole lot of um, attention in terms of shooting full frame because everything that I'm shooting now typically is for internet distribution there, so I'm uh, not too terribly worried about that. So with all that said, then along comes uh, Hasselblad with a digital medium format with pixels that are off the chart and clarity that is just uh, unimaginable at a price that uh, very few people could afford, uh, about 40 grand just for the body alone for that. Thankfully, um, other manufacturers have come along and created uh, more market-friendly consumer use types of uh, DSLRs and mirrorless. This is a mirrorless camera. Um, this is the uh, Fuji Film X-M1. This is a camera that I shoot. They quit making it. Um, about a year ago and replaced it with another camera. And they also have a DSLR version of this too. Um, I like it a lot because 
I do a lot of my photography either from a kayak or from a dual sport motorcycle. And so I want something that's small and compact and yet still has a photographic umph to go through and create the images that I want to create. Um, there are a number of DSLRs out there, like uh, the EOS, the Canon EOS Rebel. Uh, this is the T7i. Like I said, it has a, the ability to do uh, full 1080i video in terms of its resolution as well as everything that you could possibly want to do in terms of uh, exposure, especially for this class. And you can get into either uh, the Fujichrome equivalent to this or you know, a mirrorless or the DSLR uh, in a kit for, um, in a kit meeting, you've got the camera uh, and a lens, a short zoom lens for about 300 bucks. And I've seen students find them for 150 through Craigslist and see some pay more money through B&H Photo Video out of New York. It's really up to you. Uh, let me talk about, though, very quickly, the advantage between uh, a mirrorless camera and the DSLR. The uh, MX-1 being a mirrorless camera, first off, makes no sound when the shutter releases, or it makes a very quiet sound. Um, it has an electronic beep, and you can mute that. But uh, So if you're shooting uh, wildlife, or if you're shooting on a film set, for example, um, it's, a, it's a great camera to have because it makes very little noise when the shutter releases with that. And you don't have the shutter release lag time uh, with that as well. Um, the downside is I cannot see directly the light that's coming through my lens. It's interpreted through the image pickup, and so I have to depend on that pickup device. And what I'm seeing, frankly, with my Fuji, as I love this camera. Um, I love that it gives me the the coloration of old Fujichrome film of Provia and Velvia, uh, which is what I used to shoot commercially. Um, I'm able to recreate those color tones, especially in flesh tones and earth tones, just with this uh, little device. That's the reason why I bought it, why I got rid of my Canon stuff and decided to go Fujifilm. Um, but uh, what I see is not always what I get in terms of color and contrast and detail uh, through my uh, through the screen that's on the back of the camera and uh, and I began to understand in shooting I've probably got a hundred thousand frames through this thing um, and so now I know what you know what I'll what I will be seeing when I take um, when I plug my camera in and I dump my take and I go through and start editing and, and I know what's going to be happening with that but it took a little while to go through and develop that eye anyway I'm rambling on here um, hope this kind of uh, puts another little fold in your brain about your camera and about what is it you're going to need in order to be successful, not only for the assignments in this class, but to, uh, to put a finer point on your skills and your craft as a photojournalist.